Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on cognitive behavioral couple and family therapy. It's designed to accompany my textbooks, Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy and Theory and Treatment Planning in um, Family Therapy. And both of these are available from Cengage as well, or other, uh, as well as other retailers such as Amazon. And I have additional free resources at the websites listed here. Now, a lot of people have heard of uh, cognitive behavioral t um, therapy, CBT, it's commonly known. And it, a lot of folks don't make the distinction between CBT and um, what I re you know, refer to in my book is uh, CBFT, cognitive behavioral family therapy. And there's actually cognitive behavioral couples therapies and cognitive behavioral family therapies. And there's a very significant difference between um, the family-based versions, which I use for short, and I'm including the couples there, and, and the traditional CBT, in that the family and couple versions, they integrate systemic assessment and concepts and conceptualization of what's going on, so it's a much broader assessment. Cognitive behavioral therapies typically focus primarily on, you know, individual thoughts and behaviors. And... They play some, pay some um, acknowledgement of the context, but it, there's no sy you know, systematic, systemic assessment, if I can say that much, um, which is part of this. So CBFT, CBFTs are many forms of them actually, are also uh, have a very strong research base, and they're typically used um, for, with more complex problems, and I would say uh, most forms of the evidence base would say that for virtually all child and adolescent issues, that CBFTs are typically the more appropriate ones, just because you're incorporating their parents into whatever's going on with the treatment with the children. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that's how the CBFT is different than classical CBT. So the classic CBT works more with adult issues such as phobia, anxiety, and depression, where the family-based or CBFT integrates the systemic assessments. And part of what they're focusing on is how you know, one's partner or family members are mutually reinforcing each other's behaviors to maintain the symptoms and looking at those relational patterns. And so this sort of thing... Um, you can use it, you know, a classic place where it's used is with alcohol and substance abuse issues. Yes, on one hand, you know, substance, you know, use issues or disorders are an individual level, but as we know, the family system around that, whether it's a couple with adolescents, their families, it's, it's huge in terms of um, helping people maintain sobriety. So the systemic one, a lens is very critical for um, certain issues and I would say virtually all child and adolescent uh, um, concerns, the CBFTs are the ones that really they find effective, such as functional family therapy, multidimensional family therapy, even the trauma-focused CBT. It's an individual approach for working with children diagnosed or who've experienced a trauma or traumatic grief. There's a significant family component as part of that. And so most of the time with kids, involving the parents, because CBFT also involves a lot of psychoeducation, having the parent involvement is quite critical. But when you look at couple distress, which is um, a, a, a very significant um, presenting issue um, that, that, uh, that responds very well and primarily to um, couple therapy and does not respond well at all in individual treatment for um, relational issues, substance abuse, as I mentioned, as well as alcohol, eating disorders, and even trauma. Um, those sorts of things. All of these um, very common issues, it's very, uh, the CBFT is typically the um, treatment of choice, or at least the evidence, where the evidence-based treatments are is involving the relational system. And, it, and that involves a more comprehensive assessment of the social interactions and how they reinforce each other and how, like in a family or a couple, they have some problem, um, problem beliefs or schemas that need to be addressed not just in the one person, but in the system. So the JUICE, the significant contributions to the field for CBFT. So when I first started in the field, um, I was not convinced that behavioral methods used with, you know, was the uh, 
was essential, essentially, I guess, for working with children and, you know, because I read about humanistic approaches and other approaches. And I will tell you, I was quickly, um, quickly humbled uh, and corrected of that notion and, and came to realize how essential um, basic behavioral, um, and behavioral training is for raising children. And there is a huge behavioral piece to how we reinforce children. There's also a psychosocial piece, which is very important. But um, I, at least I have not yet found any way uh, it, to, to work with um, parents and parenting issues without addressing some real basic cognitive behavioral skills. And so parent training is just huge. It's very, it's one of the, it's a huge area. Um, and there are many different types of programs and methods to do this, but most of them are going to rely heavily on cognitive behavioral principles. So when you're working with parents, and of course, in addition to looking at attachment issues, which is also a very huge piece of the pie here with parent training, don't want to ignore that, but is behavior management. And this, um, the key principles are looking at the reinforcement, either positive or negative, and we're going to go into some uh, detail with all that, um, from the environment, particularly parents, uh, to shape future behavior. And that is always happening, whether you're intending to do it consciously or systematically or not. And then the second piece is consistency. So um, when working with uh, parents, uh, the younger the child, the more consistent and the more quickly you need to reinforce a behavior. And, and that's a big piece of the puzzle. And so a lot of what mental health pr practitioners do in their career is helping parents master some of this these um, these skills to help raising kids. And so a lot of what you're going to see in parent training programs are teaching compliance and positive socialization skills to children, improving parental requests. I mean, there's a real art. I've got a three and a seven year old right now. There's a real art to issuing the parental requests in ways that are effective and work. And that's a big piece of the parent training. Learning to monitor and track, you know, uh, both successes and problem behaviors, creating a contingent environment um, that teaches the children what they need to know to be successful in the world. And, you know, they use uh, one of some of the things you'll see in the parent training are small but consistent ways to reinforce children's um, behaviors. And so one of the tricks that is used is the five minute work chore. So, you know, it's similar to a timeout, but a mild form of punishment that t that parents can do. So the five minute work chore would be having your kids, um, you know, maybe sweep and mop the kitchen floor uh, when something, you know, as a uh, way, as, as a form of punishment, essentially for whatever that, what had happened. So the, the parent training piece is huge. And we're going to, as we continue in this lecture, you'll learn some of the other bits and pieces to that. But that's a, a huge, an absolutely essential skill, I believe, for all mental health uh, practitioners to uh, to master in their work. Because even if you plan to work with individuals, many times you'll be having parents coming in who are struggling with managing their children's behavior. Or sometimes you have, I've had a lot of parents who don't think it's possible to manage their children's behavior. And so uh, that may not be what they're coming for, but boy, their stress levels will go down once they uh, once they figure that out. So let's move on to talk about the process of CBFT. So there's a four step basic steps to most forms of CBFT. And the first one's always a very comprehensive assessment. And CBFT practitioners are very commonly actually, actually use pen and paper measures, such as the dyadic adjustment scale for couples to, to help the assessment process. And they will often have more structured interview uh, processes and other approaches in terms of, you know, very specific questions that they would ask of all clients coming in to do a very comprehensive, step-by-step, -step, very careful assessment. And then once they've done this, they're going to target either specific behaviors, thoughts, or interaction patterns for change. And you can see here what's, what is... Um, what they're targeting, what's, what's more, it's actually a, it's CBFT plus. Um, and so here you get the, um, you're going to do the, you know, targeting behaviors and thoughts. And that's what we are used to in CBT. And then when we add the CBFT, you can see where they're going to target specific interaction patterns that need to change. So interactions between the couple or family members or other social people in the environment. And then there's typically if, um, a a phase of education where you're teaching clients how to better um, make changes and then you systematically work with them to replace 
um, the um, old problematic thoughts, beliefs, or patterns with um, the a, a more effective one and retraining them until these new behaviors, thoughts, or interactions become the norm. So let's take a look to now to look at the therapeutic relationship in CBFT. Now more so than other approaches, the therapists in CBFT, just like traditional CBT, tend to have a much more um, directive approach, more of that of an educator or an expert. And the idea here is that the therapist is um, going to actually orchestrate and direct the actual um, process of therapy, not as a dictator, but as an expert who knows how to help clients. Empathy and being, you know, you can still be warm and empathetic in this approach, um, but empathy is used very differently in CBFT than it was, let's say, with how Roger Rogers originally developed it. Because Rogers thought of empathy as one of the core conditions as the treatment. It was what was making the change. Where in CBT, CBFT, the warmth and empathy are used to make connection, but what makes change, you know, is the education on, on better ways of dealing with, you know, thoughts you know, behaviors or interaction patterns. That's what's creating the change. So yes, there can be empathy and warmth, but it's not considered the curative element as Rogers thought of it. It's more part of building a relationship. It can be considered part of motivating clients to make change, but the um, interventions are something quite different. And the, the more contemporary, you know, CBFT is more collaborative, it's evolved. You know, with with how our society has changed, um, it's less hierarchical, and so there's more uh, culturally, and so there's more of an emphasis on a collaborative, warm relationship. Um, but nonetheless, there's there is the uh, essential assumption that the the therapist is the expert. There are written contracts are often used, and to help increase clients' motivation to engage the process of change. So now we're going to talk about the viewing or case conceptualization in CBFT. So similar to CBF, CBT uh, therapists, tra classically trained CBT therapists, uh, the way problems get defined is very specific in CBFT. And so we're looking at behavioral definitions and we're adding to it um, functional um, analysis in terms of the systemic interactions around the problem. So one of the first ways that therapists would go about um, assessment in a CBFT is getting a baseline assessment of functioning. So what it, how often does the behavior happen, um, how, uh, how frequent and how severe is it, and how long does it last? I said how often and how frequent. Those are the same things. So there are three basic pieces here, you know, the frequency, um, duration, and severity that they're looking for. And so the client, the therapist would have the client take home a, some type of log to um, note, uh, for example, if a child is having um, tantrums, you'd have the parent note, you know, when do the ha tantrums happen, how long do they last, how severe were they, what happened directly before it, what happened directly after it, to get all this information. And this in itself can be very helpful no matter what approach you work from, because humans in general have a very bad, a poor ability typically um, to accurately recall um, symptoms in terms of frequency and duration and severity, especially once the problem has gotten to the extent that you're going to go see a therapist. By that time, it feels like it's happening all the time. So if a mother's having a child who has two or three tantrums a day that last for five to 10, 15 minutes each, and that could be totally overwhelming. I mean, when a kid's, when your child's having a tantrum, it feels like time just moves so slow and it feels like it's so ever because it's so emotionally draining for the parent, or it can be. Um, and so it may feel like the kid has a tantrum all day long, you know, but the actual, when you look at it, you know, on the chart, they've had 20 minutes worth of tantrums, you know. Um, but it can feel like it's happening all the time to the parent. And so that's why it's so useful to get more objective measures of what's going on and sometimes that in itself helps the people already start to feel better oh it's not as bad as it you know it felt it just feels like it's been going on for so long it feels like it's always the kids always having a tantrum and even describing that way can make the problem feel better bigger than it is so that's why assessment um, of baseline functioning is, is very important now the functional analysis is unique to CBFT and it's looking and identifying mutually reinforcing behaviors in couples and families. And so in this, um, we're looking for 
um, what we would call the systemic reinforcers in the system. And in many ways, this is, uh, starts getting at what other forms of family therapy call, you know, what's the purpose of the symptom. So some of the things you're going to look for, um, or some of the part elements of functional analysis include, you know, what would happen if the problem were reduced in frequency? You know, what does this person and or his family or in the relationship, what did they gain from the problem? Uh, what would gain if the problems were resolved? You know, who, um, what reinforces the problem with either attention or sympathy or support? What, uh, under what circumstances is the specific problem reduced in intensity or increased in intensity? So what are the family members doing to cope with the um, problem? So this functional assessment helps get at understanding the, the relational dynamics that are either directly or indirectly reinforcing the um, problem interactions. Uh, ABC theory can also be used with couples and families in terms of this is Albert, Albert Ellis's um, work where you look at the activating event and the consequence and then you go back to identify the belief that um, mediates those two. So the activating event you know, could be your spouse saying something um, with what you perceive to be a tone in, your vo in, in, in his or her voice so you respond with a snarky comment. And, and then what the therapist would go back do go back and look at the belief that mediates those two, you know, such as, you know, my, I don't think my partner respects me or whatever it might be for that particular client. And so you, that, that type of analysis, um, cognitive behavioral analysis can also be used. They, family couple and family therapists do work with schemas um, so that you can look at the family and relationship schemas and core beliefs and identify how those might be functioning um, within the system. So such as looking at mind reading is very popular in most relationships and families, um, mislabeling each other, dichotomous black and white thinking, you know, um, you know, good child, bad child type of thing, personalization, taking everything personally, so your spouse comes home uh, tired and you personalize that as he's not, he or she's not interested in me, you know, overgeneralizing, like my kid has tantrums all day long, um, magnification. So these are, you know, some of the uh, common ways we all um, misinterpret or family schemas that might be going on that CBFTs would address for the couple or family. And for couples, they also look at some specific uh, cogn uh, cognition types that you tend to see a, li a lot uh, in couple relationships. So selective perception, focusing on only, you know, on um, certain comments or features of your partner. It's normally when we're dating in the beginning, our sub selective perception ignores all the problems. And once you're in for five years, then all you do is see the problems. So um, CBFT um, therapists work on helping couples come with, up with a more realistic perceptions. You know, attributions, you know, again, like I, I mentioned, um, you know, attrib making attributions about your partner that are um, unrealistic or unfair in some ways. Expectancies, oh my God, you can spend hours and weeks on this, but what, what are you expecting? What are the expectations of the other? Like there's some people who think that, you know, we'll never have a fight or both people should always be in the mood for sex or whatever it should be. And so those uh, often are thing areas where couples get into trouble or at least having conflict. Looking at assumptions, assumptions that are made um, in the, within the relationship, either in a given situation or in general, looking at standards and expectations we have for each other, the relationship, you know, uh, connection with uh, external family, etc. So let's move on now to talking about goal setting in CBFT. So CBFT um, goal writing it's very much in line with a lot of what insurance companies actually are looking for because they want behavioral and measurable goals. So you're going to reduce tantrums to no more than one mild one per week. So very focused on re symptom reduction. Um, and so they also, when setting goals, the CBFT therapist will really work to make sure that all members of the couple or family agree to the identified goals. Um, because that's an important piece when you're working with couples and families. And they also work uh, very ex directly and explicitly to um, get a commitment from the client in order to agree to these goals. They may have them sign a treatment plan, um, but they want explicit um, 
agreement to work towards these goals in a way that's more direct than in most approaches. So now we're going to talk about the doing, the interventions in CBFT, and there are a lot, a lot of interventions in CBFT. We're going to touch on some of the highlights here, and there are more in the books if you're interested in reading further. So classic conditioning is comes from the classical behavior tradition, uh, and if you remember the research on Pavlov's dogs, where you have the unconditioned stimulus and you pair it with um, with a conditioned uh, with a conditioned response, and so this is where you're using the food, introducing um, the bell, and so soon where the dog used to, in the beginning, only salivate when he saw the food. You pair the bell with food and all of a sudden he hears the bell and he salivates to the bell alone, even without the presence of the food. And to a certain extent, um, some of this pair, um, this basic classical conditioning can be used with couples and families. And I use it often to create, when I'm thinking about how to create rituals. And so when I'm pairing certain activities together. Um, for example, I, when I teach mindfulness, I can I would have the, the family use a bell to ring the bell to do a minute or two of meditation before going, you know, um, out the door to school or up to five minutes actually would be ideal. And so again, the purpose of this is that it creates, it helps around the transition. It's helping in this case to practice some mindfulness, some self-regulation. And there's now a pairing between getting their, um, getting ready for school and also calming down the mind and and going through and with adding the bell into that whole thing and so that adding those little pieces together it may not be the purest expression of Pavlov's but you're creating rituals at certain times and pairing um, different behaviors together to um, to help create a um, effective transition and in many ways, creating a bedtime routine for children has a very similar effect in, in the sense that you know, so when we take a bath and when we brush our teeth, this is we're doing a type of um, kind of behavioral pairing here. And it's not as clean and pure as Pavlov's research, but it's important to understand that that's why bedtime routines are so important. They help the kids uh, and help the body transition um, you know, at nighttime. So operant conditioning really is the um, bread and butter or the main focus of parent training programs. And this is where you're shaping behavior with um, rewards for successive small steps. So using, um, you know, so as uh, if you're you know, teaching your kids to do homework by themselves. So in the beginning, you may sit with them the entire time. And then once that they're able to do it, you'll, you know, pull back a little bit and do, you know, one less element of it. Maybe they do the first five minutes and then you come join them and check and see, you know, how they did or how it's going. But you eventually shape them to learn how to do their homework without you having to nag them or, um, you know, and so that they're doing it entirely independently. So when we look at some of the possibilities for reinforcement and punishment, um, we have a we have four basic types. One is the positive reinforcement or what we commonly call a reward, getting a getting rewarded for what you do. Um, negative reinforcement, so you, negative means you're taking something away, but you're reinforcing, you're trying to um, establish regularity of a certain behavior. So that's when you're re rewarding a desired behavior by removing something undesirable, like a relaxing curfew. Now, positive punishment um, is something like the five minute chore we were talking about. So it, uh, you're, again, the punishment means you're trying to reduce an undesirable behavior by adding something that's under desirable. And so that's the five minute work chore. Negative punishment um, would be reducing um, an undesirable behavior by taking something away. So in this case, you're doing the grounding. So these are the different ways and types of reinforcement and punishment that parents can use. And so typically most, um, yeah, you want to use as much reward as you can, um, but there, off, there does usually be, for most human beings, there needs to be some forms of punishment as well. And so parents need to get good at using both of these, but trying to lead with the positive ones um, does tend to, um, the positive rewards tends to be more effective if you look at the whole, you know, broad 
spectrum where we want parents to be with their parenting. But the issue for most parents really is the frequency um, and timing of the reinforcement and punishment. So ideally, the reinforcement is immediate, especially the younger the child, the more important it is. If you're working with a three, four, or five-year-old, you know, having your correction of their behavior, you know, um, needs to be relatively immediate for the learning to occur. Because a three-year-old is not going to remember, you know, um, very clearly when they, you know, poured a bucket of sand in your living room. So it needs to be immediate. Um, it's very important or if they hit their brother or sister, you know, five, even two hours ago, even an hour ago, even 15 minutes ago, for a three-year-old, they still not, may not learn much if it's that delayed. Obviously, as kids get older, that's less of an issue. But the biggest thing is consistency. And um, so I, when you're consistently re reinforcing, the child is going to learn the new behavior or stop the old behavior if you're it's a more consistent punishment of a behavior. But when it's intermittent reinforcement, that is, is this random positive reinforcing, um, the randomness begins to reinforce whatever it is. So you can, you can intermittently reinforce a well-established positive behavior like getting, you know, all A's or whatever. Every once in a while you take them out for ice cream just because you get all A's. Um, whereas with um, the consistency, if they're not consistently re uh, punishing a negative behaviors, that negative behavior is never going to go away. And that's where most parents get into trouble, is that there's a lot of inconsistent reinforcement, and that actually inadvertently reinforces the behavior because the child has learned that sometimes I'm going to get away with it, sometimes I'm not. And so 50% of the time I get away with it, I'm going to just try it anyway. And that's where most of my work with parents and parenting, where they're, where they're messing up is with the consistency and where they need the most work, let's say. Let's, let's not say messing up. Where they need the most work and what they need to focus on um, is the consistency. And there, again, it's finding small, easily reinforceable um, uh, punishments or consequences rather than these great big ones and ones that are easy for the parent to actually reinforce. So um, like the five minute work chore or doing a timeout is much better than trying to come up with this elaborate, you can't have TV for the next 24 hours, which the parent you know, may not be able to reinforce because they're not in the room all the time. That's not good. It's better to have very small consequences that are reinforcing that what mom or dad says they mean and that there will be a consequence and developing that reputation for consistency is much more important. You, you, the, the punishments don't need to be horrific, mean and awful to frighten children into compliance. You want them to be consistent because they know that this is a rule that is consistently reinforced and if I don't listen to it, I'm not going to really like what comes next. Even if it's not scary, it's just, I'm not going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to like it. I'm going to lose some of my iPad time or something along those lines. Another parenting um, intervention that goes along with shaping particularly children's behavior and even our partner's behavior is using encouragement and compliments. Because um, even with couples, this is often a big one that, you know, goes by the wayside after the first couple of years of being together. We're um, focusing on positive reinforcement to increase desired behavior. Um, and those compliments can be very, very powerful and, and expressing appreciation to increase the positive reinforcement. And again, this works in virtually all relationships. So this is also something you'll see used with couples quite a bit. So contingency uh, contracting is a um, frequently used by parents, um, and especially even as they get older, this is a, one of the few techniques you can use fairly successfully with a teenager, and that is when you're going to try to promote new behaviors by creating a contingency um, that needs to be met, uh, to, and then it's you get rewarded uh, in some ways. So this is used um, a lot with, you know, in parenting in terms of identifying how privileges will be earned and or lost. So like if your GPA is above 3.0, the parents can agree to a later um, bedtime or curfew on Friday and Saturday for a teenager. Um, with my seven-year-old, you know, if he's able to do his homework without whining, his chores without whining, and practicing, you know, his uh, karate that he needs to be doing without much, he gets 15 more minutes on his iPad each day. And it's amazing how uh, effective that can be even at a young age of 17, what people will do for their uh, electronics time. So this is definitely something that works um, 
It's more as a motivator and in not going to get you out of maybe the deepest, darkest trouble with kids, but it certainly uh, is, should be a frequent, you know, can be used in a more positive way and to give, um, especially the older teens, a sense of autonomy and even younger ones, seeing that there's a choice um, and making choices and kind of teaching them how to make good choices in their life. So this is a, a nice intervention um, for working with families. So point charts and token economies can also be, be used by parents. Typically, you'll see this used with kids um, under 12. You'll see it actually used in a fair number of classrooms, too. But again, it's shaping rewarding positive behaviors um, by building up points or some kind of token that they can then exchange you know, at the end of the week for a privilege. Or in a classroom, they might you know, get I guess something from the prize box. Um, and so then punishment is basically taking away some of these tokens and points. So again, this works for more mild types of issues um, and basic shaping and teaching good habits and behaviors. There, there is a point where you can reinforce too much with rewards and treats and positive, you know, where it's like, well, if I, the child decides they don't, you know, want a phone or they don't want to use their iPad time anymore, then now you don't have any leverage. So I think of, you know, so, so... I think one way to think of all of these ways of rewarding kids um, is to also think of it, you know, you're using these almost like training wheels to develop the good habits and behaviors so that it becomes natural. So, you know, a few years ago, I worked with my son helping a bit in the kitchen, you know, things like setting the table, picking up whatever. And, you know, early on there was some rewards, but now I don't need to reward. That's just learned that that's just part of what he does. And so that's, you know, so these are used for shaping, moving things in the right direction. Um, but if you have extreme um, behavior, or if you have a situation where there really isn't a lot of respect for the parental hierarchy, the parent hasn't been able to set effective, you know, parental limits, some of this stuff may not be your first, you know, set, go to technique in those cases. And so they're oftentimes they're using both the punishment you know, and the rewards kind of together. And generally, when you have a kid who hasn't been listening for a while, you're going to pick one, you know, mild to moderate problem to start focusing on. So, because things will definitely get worse before they get better when you start setting consequences and limits with kids if you haven't, if the parent hadn't been doing that. Because the child is naturally, they're used to a 50-50, let's say, rate of exchange or win, win, win. So half the time I get what I want. So when the parents start setting down limits and they've, been consistent, you know, 10 times in a row, the kid will often even escalate to trying to get the parent to behave the way that kids used to having the parent behave. And so things will often get worse before they get better when you do these um, behavioral, introducing behavioral consequences and it when you haven't been doing it consistently. And it does help even with the young children to sit down, okay, now here going forward, this is going to be the rule around picking up your toys or sitting down through dinner or whatever you're going to, thing you're going to start with. Definitely recommend starting only around one issue at a time and to have that conversation so that there's fewer testing of the limits and boundaries. But limit testing, boundary testing, all humans do that. Graduate students do it to their faculty every day. So um, it's just normal human behavior. And so to not pathologize it in the kids, but helping the parents to realize that they need to be consistent for their kids to learn that what they, they mean what they say. So in terms of um, behavior exchange or quid pro quo, you'll also see this used quite a bit in CBFTs. And some of this uh, involves a mutual behavior exchange. So if you do this, you know, I'll, I'll do that. And it definitely is used. You'll see it used with both families and couples. Um, but you want to use it judiciously um, because it, it does, it's not solving the underlying um, bigger problems, but it can help, you know, with certain situations, moving things forward sometimes, because you want to uh, avo avoid kind of reframing like a couple relationship as a business deal of some kind, you know, and, and that there is a lot of giving and taking. And also when I work with couples, instead of having them ask for what they want from their partner, typically it's more effective if you have each person talk about what they're willing to do for the other person because it seems more sincere. Because what can, what can happen is, you know, you whatever, do the quid pro quo agreement, you do this and I'll do that. And they come back the next week and they both did what they were supposed to do, but then now one or both partners like, well, you know, he or she only did that because they had to because of this. They didn't really mean it. 
So you need to be used as carefully, um, but there certainly are times and places and relationships where this is helpful. Another very common um, element to CBFT approaches is communication training. Most couples and families will come in saying we can't communicate. Um, and it's their, I think it's more accurate to say their communication is not effective. So there's a lot of communication tr and problem solving uh, training. You know, things, some of the things that uh, can be taught in communication training is learning to um, begin with um, a positive approach to things, sticking to a single subject, you know, really focusing on specific behavioral problems instead of, you know, you're disrespectful or, you know, you don't make me feel loved anymore. So let's get real specific and behavioral about that, you know. When you, you know, um, respond to one of my requests with, you know, by saying, no, I won't do it, you know, that makes me feel disrespected. And so then you have a very specific thing to focus on, okay? And so, you know, when you forget my birthday, yeah, or so, whatever it might be, that makes me feel unloved. Or when you walk in the door and walk right past me and don't even acknowledge me, that makes me feel unloved. So you can be much more sp being specific and behavioral in the request rather than complaining about a, a partner's, you know, person or child or parent's personality traits. And describing the impact, how it affected you, you know, focusing on taking responsibility. You know, just because your partner or your child or your parent did something, or any other person on the planet did something um, and ma that made you feel sad, angry, unloved, it doesn't necessarily mean they did something wrong. The problem could be your interpretation. You don't know yet. And it's very interesting. I, I notice, observe this a lot, um, well, actually all over the place, <laughs> both in, um, in training, in my own students and how they perceive, you know, their experiences, their clients' experiences and clients and but often there is this perception that because I'm feeling sad, mad, angry, or whatever, it's definitely got to be someone else did something wrong. And that's uh, not really um, accurate. So, but, so you're taking responsibility, holding um, when you're communicating it tentative, just because I'm feeling angry, sad, or whatever negative feeling, the person, it may be more my interpretation, something from my past that's causing me to interpret it that way than the other person. I'm um, using paraphrasing when you're um, listening to let the other person know that you have heard what they've said. Avoiding mind reading, another very fame, uh, favorite uh, couple family um, pattern that, you know, you feel like you've been married to someone for 20 years, so you know what they were thinking. You know what they're going to do. And that is unfair, even after 20 year, years of marriage. And being very direct and about disallowing, not allowing verbal abuse in parent-child relationships. And again, it's a place where the therapist would take a more educational and direct stance to intervene against um, more verbally abusive behaviors. So psychoeducation is commonly used in CBFTs just like it is in CBT and so they use psychoeducation around a lot of things including the process of therapy itself describing especially when it's an evidence-based treatment model they'll talk about this is what the next 12 to 16 sessions is going to look like um, about whatever problem might be going on or diagnosis the client might have or even around trauma, um, around couples dynamics or family dynamics. And then of course specific um, interventions or psychoeducation around around making creating change. So you can have problem oriented, you can have uh, psychoeducation where you're, you know, addressing whatever the prob presenting problem might be, the change is more the intervent using psychoeducation to actually promote the desired change. There are also that they call bibliotherapy, uh, reading outside books, you, um, popular psychology books typically. Cinema therapy where you might even have your client go and watch a movie and come back and discuss it. And this can certainly also be done with couples and families to teach various uh, about uh, relational dynamics because sometimes um, it's just easier to see it in someone else than in your own behavior. And so that's where cinema therapy can be particularly helpful. So challenging irrational beliefs, just like traditional CBT therapists, uh, CBFT therapists will either, can either directly or indirectly confront clients about irrational beliefs, especially around relationship expectations or expectations around parenting. For example, a parent who expects their child to never talk back, to never, you know, be defiant, 
um, or a parent who might even have a very age inappropriate expectations, expecting a younger child to um, be more mature than is like physiologically possible. And, you know, on the other side of that, um, expecting a teenager uh, to do less than they're actually capable of. So, so you know, this, so that's the direct confrontation. And then indirect confrontation is using a series of questions to help clients see how their belief um, or their beliefs, you know, underlying the problem behavior might be contributing, you know, to the problem. So one of the more indirect ways to confront irrational beliefs is the Socratic method, or what's called a guided discovery. And this is using inductive reasoning. So you're gently encouraging the client to um, explore their own beliefs, question their own beliefs, by using open-ended questions so that the client kind of discovers um, how they're illogical or illogical. So in this set of series of questions, the therapist tends to be neutral, but they allow the client's own logic or evidence and reason to do the convincing. So let's say that um, there's uh, maybe, let's say you're working with a couple and they're wanting to have this egalitarian relationship, but it's very clear from the outside, it's not that egalitarian. And so using guided discovery, which is, okay, so... Let's look at how, you know, you're saying, um, let's look at how the household tasks are divided up in this house and who does this and who does that. And why are you the one who does this and she's the one who does that? And well, let's look at, you know, how each of you are working. Okay, so both of you are working full time. What are the commutes like? And so how much time do both of you? So through this whole kind of process, it can become clear how unevenly the the tasks of the relationship, the, the tasks and the... Um, in the, within the relationship are actually balanced between the two partners. And it's especially for something where you're kind of confronting something that may not be very conscious, um, can be very helpful though, in using this more indirect approach the, rather than coming in and saying, I think you have a sexist division of labor in this relationship and it needs to be addressed right away. And there, so for certain client, client personalities and certain topics, this method of the Socrat Socratic questioning tends to, um, let's just say, be more effective, I would for most clients. So thought records are something that we are familiar with from traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's a structured form of journaling that helps clients analyze their own cognitions and behaviors. And this these can be used, especially with couples, where each partner could go home and do it to help them identify um, and to notice where, let's say, there's, you know, uh, the couple has conflict for each to go back and ex use the thought record to explore what was what was going on for them and their beliefs that kind of triggered their reactive reactivity. So you'd look for what the triggered response is. You would look for any automatic or negative thoughts, looking at the person's evident emotional response. And then looking for evidence for or against whatever that interpretation was, looking at the cognitive distortions, um, that may that kind of underlie this whole thing and then looking for more realistic alternative thoughts and so it's just a, a structured form of journaling that clients can use to help them identify you know and work with some of the often not so conscious and often difficult to see beliefs that are underneath or in, uh, fueling the negative interactions and so finally, it's good to, I just wanted to highlight that most CBFT therapists, just like CBT therapists, um, will assign homework tasks for the clients to do between sessions. And so you may have them do some communication exercises if it's a couple, and the, then when the clients come back, they report on how things went. And so homework is very common in CBFT approaches. So now I want to talk a bit about mindfulness and mindfulness-based therapies um, and, and distinguishing those from mindfulness-informed therapies. Mindfulness-based therapies are typically group programs that meet for eight weeks or so and teach the actual mindfulness meditation, whereas mindfulness-informed therapies use the concepts of mindfulness and the related concept of acceptance to inform how they conceptualize client problems and intervene with those. So what is mindfulness? 
And what are these mindfulness approaches? So in a nutshell, mindfulness is the intentional focusing, so focusing on purpose, on some kind of present moment experience without judging it, and uh, doing so with compassion and acceptance for whatever arises in one's consciousness. And the most frequent form of this is a breath meditation where you focus on your breath and notice what thoughts arise um, in your mind while well, actually trying to quiet your, as you try to quiet your mind, and as the thoughts or feelings or distractions, external distractions, um, your mind starts wandering off to pay attention to that noise, or to a thought, or to an emotion, your task is to notice eventually that your mind has wandered and just bring it back to a quiet, quieting all the thoughts and language in your mind, just watching the breath. And so it's a constant back and forth between focusing, losing focus, and refocusing. And in terms of acceptance, um, a lot of the difficult part of this practice, besides getting yourself to sit down and do it, um, is when you refocus, is to do so by accepting and not judging yourself or being frustrated with yourself for not being able to focus for more than three seconds, which is pretty common, actually. And so there's this element of teaching acceptance for whatever arises, and that's that is a big piece of why I think mindfulness has become so important. We we live in a culture and a time where acceptance of that level, accepting what is, is not part of dominant American culture. We are all about progress and improvement, and you know, getting better and better and better. And this concept of accepting where we are is, is goes very much against that. And the the drive for improvement is is not bad in and of itself. It's actually why we have progress that we have um, and the technology that we have and um, so much of what we have, so much of what we consider good in our culture is because of this desire to constantly improve. But it has a shadow side, a dark side, and the dark side is we're never happy with where we are. And so if the goal is to get to happiness, um, too much of that drive is problematic. And we actually have to go back and almost reteach ourselves acceptance and learn how to balance the tension between accepting what is while still striving to make improvement. Compassion is very similarly and closely related to this concept of acceptance. So not just accepting in resignation um, the way, you know, where we are and how we are, but doing it with compassion. And so that acceptance peace and compassion peace are a very important part of the practice. And a lot of what is actually happening through mindfulness is you're shifting a person's relationship to the problem. And so and it's counterintuitive because you think if you're working on accepting what is, how is anything going to change? And But when you accept what is, you stop, I think more is stop fighting with what is. <laughs> and if you're not going to be resisting what is and going in denial about what is, you will be much, usually much more creative in addressing whatever that problem. So, you know, an example is with a, someone who's in a, um, a violent relationship. And you may think acceptance, you know, might mean just resignation, accepting that, you know, my partner's violent. I'm just going to accept my partner the way, you know, let's say we'll use the gender stereotypes he is. So, but what they mean by mindfulness here is that it's accepting what is in your and what is going on and so the example so for someone who's it being battered in their relationship accepting what is means to not run away from the fact and to be fully emotionally compassionately present and accepting the reality that you know I am being you know there is violence in my relationship and uh, you know my partner is hitting me or whatever form the violence might take and that's the reality and my sense is that most people don't actually, they do whatever, they develop a lot of symptoms to not accept that's what is. Um, and that's a very important piece because once you accept that that is what's happening in your mind, you're not playing mind games with yourself. Oh, you know, it's not because he was drinking. Oh, no, he's under a lot of pressure at work. That's what it was. So, you, you know, accepting what is is you're not going to accept all those. You're not making up all these excuses for what is. You engage what is even when it's a very difficult reality. Um, and so a lot of the mindfulness uh, we talk about is grounded in Buddhism and social um, and constructivism because Buddhism is a constructivist approach or constructivist philosophy, I should say. 
And so a lot of the mindfulness work comes out of that, but virtually, I mean, most major religions, um, Christianity has contemplative prayer, um, there's Jewish meditation, Jewish forms of meditation, so most major world religions will have some form of focusing the breath to calm the mind, um, and most world cultures have some kind of practice within them um, where the, that invites a person to focus on their breath to quiet their mind, and this is a very universal practice. The Buddhists have probably the most elaborate system of, you know, um, of meditations and, and really focus on identifying the different states of human consciousness that are possible. Um, but this pra basic practice of mindfulness and the way, we've, way it's been imported essentially into mental health is using it um, in a way that is not religiously based and one where it's this basic practice of focusing on the breath. So now I just want to touch on a couple of those specific forms of mindfulness, a couple specific mindfulness approaches. So mindfulness-based stress reduction is an eight-week program, and it was the first major mindfulness approach um, in the West. It's all been in practice for almost 40 years. John Kabat-Zinn developed it at the University of Massachusetts, really around chronic pain patients. And there are eight sessions with one long Saturday retreat where they talk, um, teach clients basic mindfulness. Um, they, and you can see these are the different focuses of each of the different uh, weeks, you know, being patient, non-striving, non-judging, acknowledgement, letting it be, learning how to use it in every day, um, and then the practice never ends. So this is the kind of the uh, quintessential or the original uh, mindfulness-based program. And so every all the other approaches... Um, it's cognitive therapy, which we will briefly mention. Um, there's one for eating disorders, there's one for substance abuse, there's one for couples. Uh, so there are multiple approaches that are based on this basic eight-week format. So mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is a very important one to be aware of, too, because this has really become the gold standard of depression relapse, because depression, um, there are different sorts of est different estimates by different people, but up the more common one you'll hear is that 50% of people diagnosed and treated, successfully treated for, minor, for major depressive disorder using either medication, psychotherapy, or both, relapse within six months, within the first year. 50%, that's pretty bad. So mindfulness, uh, so uh, what they call depression relapse prevention has become a real focus. And so the MBCT has been the most effective. Um, it's considered the gold standard now in mindfulness uh, in uh, pr pr reducing depression relapse. And so this is an eight-week program built on a similar foundation and premises of the mindfulness-based stress reduction, where the, there's more psychoeducation around stress in general. And in MBCT, they're going to be talking more about depression and anxiety. There's um, psychoeducation on depression and anxiety within this and focus on that um, in the curriculum. Here you can see the topics for the, um, the eight different sessions. So dialectical behavior therapy actually is an evidence-based treatment for treating borderline personality. It's probably the better known one. Mm -hmm. And but mindfulness is part of their, um, their, their core skills in terms of teaching client using mindfulness-based principles. They don't have them meditating every day necessarily. Um, the way they would in a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or mindfulness-based stress reduction, but they're using these principles to help clients learn how to self-regulate. And so they're looking a lot, the word the term dialectics, but they're focusing on uh, the dialectic tension between two polar opposites um, and that kind of black and white and flip-flopping that's characteristic of the borderline personality. But they find that the curriculum of dialectical behavior therapy, which is very much, uh, there's a there's a group, 52-week group curriculum that goes with the approach, um, that that curriculum is really focuses on self-regulation and learning basic coping skills. And so it's very effective and helpful for many different types of clients with um, those sorts of issues. So acceptance and commitment therapy is, or it's pronounced ACT, not ACT, although I like to say ACT, but it's pronounced ACT, it's supposed to be uh, said ACT. Anyway, this is a mindfulness-informed therapy where they use a lot of the concepts um, of mindfulness and acceptance, and they use that to inform their 
otherwise what would look like a fairly normal CBT conversation. Uh, but they they talk about how um, you know you when you're uh, they don't have the clients meditate, but they have them kind of step back and observe their thoughts in motion. Like you can choose to jump on your thought train and you know go see where it goes, or you can step back and watch those thoughts go by. You know, just because you're having a thought, it doesn't mean you need to stand by it or believe it. Just because you're having an emotion, doesn't need to you need to run inside your head and find a good justification for it. You know, and so you need you can they're creating that cognitive space, that observer perspective of the mind, so that a person has constant con- conscious choice rather than just reactive to whatever's going on. So the basic process that so they look at accepting and embracing difficult thoughts and feelings, and that's really what is meant by acceptance. It's really um, the the term gets translated into English as acceptance, and we have this uh, connotation for in the, the English language with acceptance often being around the resignation or something negative. And this is more, I think, embracing difficult thoughts um, and being alive and being present to them, um, not denying them, um, is is what they mean by this. And, you know, there are some theorists who talk about, you know, basically all psychological symptoms are one way or the other, the person is trying to deny some form of reality. And that's where these symptoms develop from. So the C is choice and choosing to commit to a life direction, um, standing behind values and beliefs uh, that you really believe in, and the T is taking action in this correct, in this life direction that is desired. Um, and I will say, if you like metaphor, I, I think there's no therapy that does metaphor better than um, acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, but it's a great approach that is kind of considered part of the third wave of behaviorism where well, this is what the big shift is here is, you know, in traditional CBT, we're trying to get rid of irrational thoughts, you know, trying to stop thought stopping type things. Um, or, you know, we're trying to get rid of something that's bad. And what's different in this third wave of behaviorism is that we are we're not trying to stop the thought. We're just trying to accept it, which is kind of weird and not does not go is not really part of the traditional way of conceptualizing but what we have found is it's nearly impossible to stop our thoughts okay <laughs> but when you accept them they lose their power and you then can be non-reactive to them but if you're constantly fighting them and trying to suppress them or get them out of your head paradoxically they do tend to get stronger so this is a very interesting um kind of twist in the development of cognitive behavioral uh, thought. So there, is, there are some approaches um, using mindfulness in couple and family therapy. There is a couples-based enhancement group which is used for non-distressed couples, couples who are doing fairly well and wanting to strengthen their relationship. And that actually focuses on a compassion form, compassion meditation that's related to mindfulness more than traditional mindfulness. Um, but cultivating this mindfulness, um, they have found, does help with marital satisfaction, um, lower emotional stress, and better communication for couples. And for the families, there are multiple different uh, mindfulness-based parenting programs. Or many, many times, what they've done is taken a traditional parenting program and integrated the mindfulness piece in it. And in some of these, they are teaching the parents to self-regulate. Um, their emotions in order to be more present. And some some of these emphasize becoming mindfully aware of the interac- negative interaction patterns that's going on. But the mindful parenting, um, mindfulness is being integrated even to childbirth classes and such. I think one of my all-time favorite studies in all of mental health is one where they, it was a case study of all things, uh, but it was, they taught two mothers who had seven-year-old sons who were diagnosed with ADHD. They taught the mothers, the first stage was they taught the mothers mindfulness and to practice mindfulness. And based on that for a couple of weeks, that the, the boys, their children's uh, ADHD behaviors got better just with the mothers meditating. And then they went and taught it to the, to the boys and there were additional, you know, effectiveness. But, you know, as a mother, as a mother myself who practices mindfulness, I... I don't know how I would have gotten through, especially the early years where the babies cry a lot um, and you're exhausted a lot. The mindfulness is, can be extremely helpful. And how it works, too, is if you practice some every day, you're much better able to self-regulate and watch your thoughts. And and so, you know, 
when you've got a young child who cries a lot, for a lot of mothers' experience, it's almost like a physiological stress response gets triggered when your baby cries. And I'm sure it's a survival thing. Um, and and yet, what I would do is just for three seconds, I would just focus my breath, focus on my breath, get myself calm, and turn off that you know almost natural. It was like a physiological stress response would just get triggered on that baby, and I'd shut it down, and I could shut it down in three seconds because I practice, you know, at other times of the week, and so you you develop that be, almost behavioral conditioning where I'm able to shut that off, and then I could respond in a much calmer state of mind rather than a kind of frenetic one, which is very easy to get into when you're totally sleep deprived. Um, you're so sleep deprived, you can't see straight, and so your stress response is like on all the time, and so the mindfulness this can be very very helpful with parents of all ages because when they're young you're sleep deprived and they're just crying and I, you know it, it actually gets tougher as, as it goes on and so having mindfulness uh, for parents of teens is also definitely there is a place for that too research and the evidence base for CBFT so CBFTs are some of the best researched approaches in family therapy and many of them have decades of research behind them and and they are continually refined as they go through and a, an a example of one of the ones that have gone through that is the integrated behavioral couples therapy and this is one of the two highly regarded couples evidence-based couples therapy with EFT emotionally focused couples therapy being the other and you know the integrated behavioral couples therapy began as couple, behavioral couples therapy and although they got good uh, outcomes those outcomes um, didn't have good long-term the uh, long-term outcomes were not as good as the short-term outcomes so couples got well for or did well for you know the first six months but after that they would revert and so they added the concept of acceptance actually after we've been talking about acceptance acceptance in this case of who your partner is because actually the uh, integrated behavioral couples therapy is considered also one of the mindfulness based mindfulness informed ones excuse me um, and the fact that you're focusing on accepting your partner as he or she is without and without personalizing those personality differences um, but these approaches have been very carefully developed and actually are indicated for a wide variety of, of child, um, child issues as well as adult issues, even adult depression. Um, because adult depression is often commonly correlated um, with marital dissatisfaction. And in fact, um, there are researchers who, you know, again, the research is getting specific enough and uh, sophisticated enough to say that, you know, if the depression, if the marital distress or couple distress started before the depression, like more or less it was causing it, seems to be causing it, then couple therapy might be where you start without the pharmaceuticals. Um, where if we know, however, someone's been depressed for a while, that couples therapy is also warranted um, if they're in a long-term relationship. Uh, but depression does not make for a happy couple. So it needs to be addressed to keep you know, working on the couple issues along with the depression. Um, something we often think of as a very individual problem, but if you live with anyone who is depressed <laughs> or, um, or has OCD, you know, it, it has huge effects on those relationships. And so increasingly people are and beginning the, to realize the importance of having the family or partners involved in treating what's think of as, thought of as individual issues. And even with um, couples for substance abuse and alcohol abuse, another huge area you know, couple family therapy is almost almost always more successful than um, treating the, the person individually. And so, you know, using and considering, especially when people are in, a, you know, committed relationships and families, obviously with kids having their parents involved. And family therapy is, is typically indicated for most major mental health issues as a form of relapse prevention. Because if you really got an alcoholic to stop drinking or a substance abuser to stop using or someone who was depressed to stop, you know, being depressed, you know, having the, um, or someone who had the eating disorders to stop that or to someone who's hoarding to stop hoarding, these are pretty um, uh, life-changing uh, symptoms and life-changing uh, events. And so having the whole family needs to be restructured to develop new family 
reorganize the family interactions to support these people in their um, sobriety or in their, you know, to prevent relapse, whatever it is, that the family involved in involving the family is usually really helpful in reducing um, relapse. And even with schizophrenics or psychotic uh, disorders that they find, um, and actually instead of the term schizophrenics, I delete that, I mean persons diagnosed with schizophrenia or person diagnosed with um, psychotic type issues, that having family intervention is significant, significantly reduces the relapse rate, the use of medication, and um, reduces symptoms. And so if you'll find that the family CBTs are frequently used, especially in relapse prevention. So tapestry weaving, working with diverse populations. So uh, CBFTs um, are definitely used widely with um, diverse clients, and there's actually been specific research and you know applying with you know Hispanic Latino populations, African Americans, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, um, using them with sexually um, sexual identity diversity. So lots of different populations. It, there has been research on it. And that said, it is an approach that you need to be thoughtful and careful in terms of how you use this with diverse populations to avoid any conflicts in values um, and relational styles because there is this assumption that the therapist is the expert. Um, you want to be very careful that you're not, um, that the therapist isn't biased in terms of whatever values might be. Uh, embedded in whatever psychoeducation that you're getting. Um, well, one of the areas where that ha happens the most is around values that are very individualistic versus, uh, you know, cultures that might be more collectivistic in their values. So value, putting the self, the personal needs aside for the need of the group. And so a lot of the assumptions when you're looking at what is an irrational thought, you know, from a individualistic culture, when you're looking at some of the collectivist culture values, you, that may look irrational to put your happiness aside for that of your family, um, but that may be the cultural value. And of course, um, most people using this approach, if you're in, you know, let's say the United States using this approach, you're working with, a, you know, a Chinese American, so that someone who's got, uh, you know, and this is where what generation you're a part of is very significant. So looking at, okay, so the, they have the Chinese culture, but they're living in America, and typically where you're going to see the conflict is um, in immigrant families or second, third generations, you'll definitely still see this even fourth generation sometimes, where the parents will typically want to be closer aligned to the, um, the let's say, the culture of origin, we're using China as the example here, uh, where the children might be more aligned with the... Um, culture in which they're residing, which, and it's actually their culture, of, they might claim it as their culture of origin where they were born here in the United States, let's say. And so, so here you've got like one family, but you've got two different sets of cultural values with some real fundamental differences there. And so there's no simple, easy, right answer in these sorts of situations. And then often this gets, you add onto it a layer of complexity, such as, let's say that the wife um, is wants to align more with American female identity than traditional Chinese woman identity. And so then you can add the gender dynamics that get um, pulled into this. Or the daughter wants to be more like her American peers. And so, you, you know, this is where just the CBT, CBFT practitioner wants to be very careful and educate themselves on the different values so that they can be sensitive to these um, in their, you know, in terms of communication training, you know, making sure that it is communic what's what's appropriate, quote unquote, appropriate communication training or what's a communication is very culturally defined. I mean, much of what our culture tells us is it tells us how to communicate with one e each other in a respectful way and what that looks like you know, in an Asian culture versus a Native American culture versus, a, you know, a Latino Hispanic culture versus, you know, the United States culture. You know, all of these have totally different definitions of what appropriate communication looks like, how close we can stand to each other, how, how 
if we can look each other in the eye, whether that's rude. If we, you know, in some of these cultures, it's rude to look someone in the eye. In other cultures, it's rude not to look someone in the eye. So if you're going to do communication training, there's a lot you need to be very aware of that's very culturally defined. And, and even with all that awareness, there's not always a correct answer, except for that, oh, okay, these are cultural differences we're looking at, not necessarily personal differences. And so it's just um, being uh, more cautious uh, when working, especially when there are multiple cultural values that are, are at play. When you're working with diverse clients. That said, you know, the hierarchical expert position is actually very comfortable for many um, clients coming from diverse ethnic backgrounds. Um, and it's more what they expect someone who's got a, you know, who's got a license and a degree to be doing is giving the advice. It looks more like what our medical doctors even do in our own culture. And so it's just important that when you're doing those psychoeducational pieces and are identifying what's irrational or, you know, a dysfunctional behavior, it, that needs to be put through, you know, cultural analysis, really with virtually any client. Because even if, quote unquote, European Americans, Northern Europeans are have individualistic cultures, or in Southern Europe, you know, if you think of Greece and Italy and Spain, you're going to have much more collectivist cultures. So even European American doesn't tell you very much in terms of their values, and those can be um, very much cross-cultural uh, relationships and very different sets of values. And it's funny, we all sit back when, at least in the United States, we act like, oh, they're all from Europe, they're all the same, it's all individualistic. It's not true at all, because the Southern Euro European cultures are much, very much collectivist cultures, and strongly so even, even upon their... Um, immigration usually. So these are just all um, things to keep in mind when working from this perspective. So in wrapping it up here, I just want to highlight that CBFT uh, is a very strong um, force really in the evidence-based treatment world in terms of working with couples, family, children, adolescents, uh, relapse prevention. It's widely used. It is it is something that is distinct from the traditional CBT, and it's it's more complex, definitely, in its application because they're introducing, analyzing cognitions, behaviors, and emotions within the broader um, relationship systems that a client is in, and looking how um, families and couples kind of mutually reinforce the problem behavior pattern. That said, it still uses many interventions that are common in the traditional CBT world and, and has many of the similar features, but it does add, uh, it adds to it rather than really takes anything away. So it is a much more complex um, approach. So I hope this was a useful introduction to a CBFT, and I encourage you to continue reading more. Thanks so much.